So we are continuing our summer series, uh, Hearing Different Psalms. We're calling it our, our summer playlist. And uh, this morning we're gonna hear Psalm 131. And Carrie Anderson is gonna come forward and read that for us today. The words will be on the screen. This is from the NRSV, but if you have a different version with you today, you're, you're welcome to follow along. O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. My soul is like the weaned child that is with me. O oh Israel, hope in the Lord from this time on and forevermore. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Carrie. Yeah, do you want to just set it back down on the communion table? That'd be great. On May 29th, 1953, uh, Sir Edmund Hillary conquered Mount Everest with his Sherpa friend and guide, Tenzin Norgay. The first human beings, if you could put up a picture for me there, the first human beings to be, uh, to be able to do this. So you can see uh, Hillary on the left, uh, and then there's Norgay on the right. And what they achieved, especially in 1953, when they had limited accessories, nothing like what we have today for, for mountain climbing, really stands as one of the greatest human feats of the 20th century. Now, Hillary was celebrated for this achievement. He, uh, he's a New, New Zealander that under, was under the kind of the, British, uh, kind of the British reign, and so he was knighted by the queen because of this achievement. And then 40 years later, in 1995, he received the, the highest award in British society, the Order of the Garter, which is an exclusive membership that has only 24 members who are part of it. But here's the thing, more important to Hillary than all of these honors that he received, and he received a lot more honors than what I just mentioned, more important than all of that were his efforts to give back to the people of Nepal something of what they had given him. In 1960, he established the Himalayan Trust and gave money, tons of money, to build hospitals, airfields, and schools to help the, the Nepalese people flourish. Now, there's one story that really captures the essence of Sir Edmund Hillary's character and really his outlook on life. On one of his many trips back to the Himalayas, he was spotted by a group of tourist climbers. And they went up to him, and recognizing the legend that was in their midst, they begged if they could get a photograph with him. And Hillary was kind enough to oblige them. They handed him an ice pick, and then they kind of staged the photograph, and all got around him. And they were about to take the picture when another climber passed by and didn't recognize, didn't recognize the man standing in the midst of them, didn't know that this was the legendary Hillary. And this man had the audacity to go up to Hillary and said to him, excuse me, that's not how you hold an ice pick. Let me show you. And he fixed it. Now this would be like going up to Lebrain, uh, Le, Lebrain, uh, James Lebron. Uh, Lebron James. I want to say Michael Jordan, but you know, I mean, that's an old, older guy thing. To, uh, or better, Caitlin Clark, and saying to them, here's, here's how you hold a basketball. Or it would be like going up to Patrick Mahomes or Tom Brady and saying, here's how you grip a football, right? I mean, to, to go up to this legendary uh, mountain climber and say, here's how you hold an ice pick. Everybody stood around dumbfounded. But you know what Hillary did? He kindly thanked the man let him adjust the pick, and then Hillary went on and took the photograph holding the pick wrongly. <laughs> now this incident was not an isolated incident, but it was characteristic of Hillary's entire approach to life. Sir Edmund Hillary in so many ways embodied the humility that I believe is at the, the heart of Psalm 131. Now Psalm 131 is one of these 15 songs of, um, that are called Psalms of Ascent, 
And Brian Follett preached on one of them. You did Psalm 133, right? And then I did Psalm 126 last week. We're doing Psalm 131 today. There are 15 psalms, Psalm 120 to Psalm 134, that are part of this cluster of psalms called the Songs of Ascent. And I talked about that a little bit last week, but they're called this because these were really traveling songs that God's people sang as they traveled up to Jerusalem for Jewish festivals. uh, Jerusalem was topographically the highest place in Palestine, so there was like a literal sense of ascending as they sang these songs on their way to these festivals. But it also was metaphorical because it was a way of really spiritually kind of preparing their hearts to ascend or be lifted up into the presence of God at the temple. This psalm um, is the shortest psalm, and it it might even be, actually it might be the shortest psalm in the entire Psalter, uh, but it is packed with profound truth and wisdom. In the words of the great preacher Charles Spurgeon, it is one of the shortest psalms to read, but one of the longest psalms to learn. And I think that that's so true, that we will spend all of our lives learning to live this psalm that's all about humility. And that's because humility is not something that comes natural to any of us. I mean, how does that old country gospel song put it? Something like this, Lord, it's hard to be humble. And it is hard to be humble. And yet, humility is at the heart of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. The psalmist begins the psalm this way, O Lord, my heart is not lifted up, Another way to translate the Hebrew is my heart is not proud. My eyes are not raised too high. Another way to translate the Hebrew there is my eyes are not haughty. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. Now many believe that David wrote this psalm. We don't know that for sure, but it was written by David or someone else, likely um, by someone who knew what it was, was like to fall into the trap of pride. Maybe they had fallen into the trap of pride and struggled with pride in the past, or they were struggling with pride in the present, maybe both. But the psalm is really a testimony of one who had learned and was continuing to learn humility, what it means to humbly be satisfied in God and in God alone. In his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis designates an entire chapter to the vice of pride. And, And Lewis says this about pride. He says, pride is the greatest sin, the essential vice, the utmost evil. He said, pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. Now those are really strong words, and maybe you're thinking, okay, is that a bit of an overstatement? Come on, Lewis, you're kind of laying it on heavy there. I mean, after all, we live in a cutthroat culture where not only do we get rewarded for being highly ambitious and proud, But if you're not somebody who's highly ambitious and proud, you're likely gonna get trampled on or left behind. I'm reminded of these words of the boxing legend Muhammad Ali, who was only reinforcing the value of our culture when he once said this. He said, at home, I'm a nice guy, but I don't want the world to know. Humble people, I found, don't go very far. Humble people don't get very far. Muhammad Ali, in contrast to Sir Edmund Hillary, was not somebody who was remembered for his humility. There's a true story about a time in which Muhammad uh, Ali was on an airplane and the pilot came over the intercom and told the passengers to fasten their seatbelts because they were about to hit turbulence. One of the flight attendants went through the cabin and she noticed that Ali was the only one on the plane who ignored the pilot's instructions. So she went up to him and she said, excuse me, sir, would you please fasten your seatbelt? Ali looked at her calmly and said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. Without missing a beat, she snapped back. Well, Superman don't need no plane either. (laughs) Here's the thing about pride. Muhammad Ali may be an extreme example of someone whose heart is proud and whose eyes are haughty, and we may hear examples like that and say, okay, Brian, at least I'm not like that. I mean, that's just kind of pure arrogance. I think one of the paradoxes 
in our society is that on the one hand, we value pride, but on the other hand, we're often repelled or turned off by people who are arrogant. We don't like it when we see it in others, no matter how great they are, but this is precisely why C.S. Lewis says that pride is so deadly. He says, because we can spot it a mile away in somebody else, we're so quick to see pride in somebody else, but we are largely blind to pride in our own hearts. Lewis would say that pride runs on self-deception. John Calvin, the 16th century pastor, put it this way. He said, the human heart has so many crannies where vanity hides, so many holes where falsehood, falsehood lurks, is so decked out with deceiving hypocrisy that it often dupes itself. When we're talking about self-deception in general, and pride in particular, the, the thing about this is that, that pride has a way of leading to spectacularly bad judgments about ourselves. How smart we are, how good we are, how virtuous we are, how spiritual we are, it, it has a way of, of distorting our vision. But it doesn't just lead to bad um, judgments about ourselves, it, it, it also leads to spectacularly bad judgment about other people. We have a tendency to inflate our own virtue and downplay our own flaws, but then with other people we do the exact opposite. We inflate their flaws and we downplay their virtues. Pride causes us to see ourselves as better than we really are and to see others as worse than they really are. Not only does pride lead to, to bad judgments about ourselves and others, but it also leads to poor judgment about God and about what's happening around us. I mean, the fact that it leads us to judge God at all shows us how pride really is about trying to take the place of God. It's about us removing God from the throne and putting ourselves on the throne, and we wanna be the judge. Friends, I think this is the besetting sin of humanity. I mean, this goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden with, uh, with Abraham, or Adam and Eve. We, we wanna be our own gods. We wanna be in charge of our own lives and often in charge of the lives of others. Here's Lewis again. Lewis says, as long as you are proud, you cannot know God. A proud man or a proud woman is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. As long as you are looking down on others, you will not be able to see what is above you, namely God. The psalmist wants to avoid all of this. O Lord, my heart is not proud, my eyes are not haughty. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. Here's my paraphrase of what the psalmist is getting at. The psalmist, in effect, is saying, I'm not trying to be you, God. I'm humbling myself, assuming my place as the creature and not as the creator, for you alone are God. But what does it mean to humble ourselves? If that's the challenge and the invitation of Psalm 131, what does it mean to humble ourselves? If pride is about thinking too highly of ourselves and looking down on others, does that mean that humility, which in the Hebrew and Greek both means low, is humility about thinking lowly of ourselves? I think this is one of the biggest misunderstandings about humility, is that we often think that humility means I need to think badly about myself, or I need to put myself down, or it's about beating yourself up. That's not what humility is. Nor is humility just being a doormat for others. And it's not about denying your own gifts and your abilities and your talents. Humility, when we look to the scriptures, is really about thinking about yourself rightly. Humility is seeing yourself as God sees you. It's seeing others as God sees them. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 12. If you could put that up there for me. Don't think too highly of yourself, says Paul. And I think we could also add, nor think too lowly of yourself, but instead, here's the key, but think with sober judgment. 
Humility is about thinking about ourselves with sober judgment, seeing ourselves accurately, seeing others accurately. I think the next couple lines then of Psalm 131 gives us a wonderful picture of true humility. This is my favorite part of the psalm. Here's what the psalmist says, but I have calmed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child with its mother, my soul is like a weaned child that is with me. I really like the way that the message renders this verse. The message puts it this way. I have kept my feet on the ground. I've cultivated a quiet heart. Like a baby content in its mother's arms, my soul is content. I've cultivated a quiet heart. The image of a, of a baby in a mother's arms, content. My soul is content. Humility is about cultivating a quiet heart. It's about a content soul. Whereas pride is about wanting to be God, wanting to put ourselves at the center, humility is about the kind of contentment we find in letting God be God and recognizing that we are God's children. Where else have we heard this image of being a child, by the way, in the scriptures? Do you remember? Can you think of another spot where it talks about a humble and genuine faith as being related to, the, to a child? Well, how about Matthew chapter 18? This is where Jesus and his disciples are, are traveling, and the disciples ask him, Jesus, Rabbi, who will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And do you remember what Jesus does, what he says in this moment? How does he respond to their question? It becomes an object lesson, right? He takes a child and puts a child on his lap, and then he says to his disciples, I tell you the truth, unless you become like these children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And then this next part, therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. We find contentment, our souls find contentment when we humbly embrace who we are in God's eyes. Sinners who have been saved by grace through faith, adopted as sons and daughters of God in Christ. I mean, Psalm 131 speaks beautifully about this kind of dependence on God, a healthy kind of dependence. It's about finding our ultimate satisfaction in God. It's about keeping God at the center rather than trying to put ourselves at the center. I think the description here of a weaned child is such an important detail. Not only for what the psalmist is saying, but also for us as we think about humility. I don't want to skip over that. Think about that. A weaned child, a weaned child is, is not a fussy infant who cries loudly for his mother's milk, but a weaned child is a content child who sits quietly in his mother's arms and finds joy and delight in being with her. I love that picture. I think that's a picture of a content soul. Do you see what the psalmist is saying in terms of what it means to have a humble and mature faith? I think what the psalmist is saying is that to have a humble and mature faith is to love God and desire God, not for what we can get from God, but that a humble and mature faith is a faith that is learning to love and trust God simply for who God is and not what we get from God. It's about learning to delight in being in loving union with Jesus. Again, not because of the benefits that we get from Jesus, and we do get benefits from him, but, but the most mature love is loving Christ, loving God for who he is, even when we don't understand God's ways. Even when life does not go the way that we planned or want it to go, a humble, mature faith, a contented soul, confidently trusts that God is with us and that God is still working all things out for his good. So here's my question for you this morning. Have you learned to love God and to trust God simply for who he is and not because of what he can do for you? Not because of what you get from him? Eugene Peterson puts it this way. He says, Christian faith is not a neurotic dependency, but a childlike trust. We do not have a God who forever indulges our whims, but a God whom we trust with our destinies. It's not a neurotic dependency. It's not a childish 
kind of dependency where we're passive and we just want God to kind of overfunction for us, but it's a childlike trust. I think there's a difference between a, a, a childish kind of faith and a, and a childlike trust that says, God, I'm trusting you, I'm taking responsibility, but I'm trusting you, and not only trusting that you're with me now, but I'm trusting you with my future. Friends, that's what hope is. Hope is trusting God with the future. That's why the psalmist ends by saying, O Israel, hope in the Lord. Now and forevermore, a contented soul trusts God who holds our destinies in his hands. Now all this talk about humility this morning, maybe it raises a question for you about ambition. And as I wrap up, I kinda wanna go here. Because for, for those of us who really like to do things, and for those of us who are maybe type A personalities, you're saying, Brian, wait a minute, is ambition a bad thing? Is that what Psalm 131 is saying? I mean, how does a quiet heart not slip into a lazy heart? How does a content soul not atrophy into a complacent soul. And I think one of the things that I wanna say about that this morning is that God is not opposed to ambition, to worldly ambition, yes, to selfish ambition, yes, but God is not opposed to a good kind of godly ambition, a good kind of ambition that embraces humility, that seeks to honor Christ, that keeps God at the center of our lives. A a good kind of ambition is the kind of um, ambition in which we, we channel our creative energy in such a way that it moves us to keep growing up into Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. A godly kind of ambition is the creative energy that moves us to love God more deeply and to love others A godly ambition motivates us to take responsibility, to do our part, to be innovative, to create good art, to solve problems, to strive for excellence, to tackle injustice, to get out there and help people who've been impacted by the floods, to care for the weak and the poor and the vulnerable, to preach the gospel to the nations, to seek first the kingdom of God. The Apostle Paul himself talked about this this godly kind of ambition when in Philippians he says, I press on for the prize. Forgetting what lies behind, I strain forward to what lies ahead. And he says, I work with all the energy that the Holy Spirit inspires within me. Friends, God wants us to be content, yes, but he does not want us to be complacent. And there is a world of difference between those two words. My conviction is that the more content we are in Christ, the more that we rest our hearts in Jesus and embrace humility, it will not lead us to complacency or to laziness or to apathy, but it will lead us all the more to take up the cross and to passionately follow Jesus. My conviction is that when we embrace humility, it will lead us to a more courageous obedience, a deeper conviction and a stronger resilience that some of the greatest men and women throughout history have been some of the most humble Some of the people who've accomplished the most in history have been those who are the most humble. Just think again about Sir Edmund Hillary. And let me close by going back to where I began this morning. So according to the story, when Sir Edmund Hillary reached the the summit of Mount Everest, he marked his achievement by leaving a small crucifix in the snow. Now it was really puzzling as to why he did this, because he was not known, I mean he was known to be a good man, but he was not known to be an overtly religious man. Why did he put the crucifix in the snow? Perhaps it was a token of his own humility. Maybe it was him trying to honor kind of a higher power in this moment of triumph. Regardless of what Hillary intended by doing this, wouldn't you agree that putting a cross in the snow is a most fitting gesture? I mean, because it is the cross where Jesus shows us the ultimate example of humility. And it's in the resurrection where we see God's greatest triumph for the sake of the world. It's in the cross that Jesus himself lowered himself in order that we might ascend to God, that we might be brought into life with God. It's in the cross that Jesus gives us an example of what it means to be faithful disciples of Jesus who can only ascend to greatness by humbling ourselves and becoming a servant 
to all. You've heard me say this before, but in the kingdom of God, the way up is the way down. As Henry Nouwen says, the way of Christ is not the way of upward mobility, but it's always the way of downward mobility, of taking up the basin and the towel and being a servant. I think this is an important word for all of us this morning, but as we're about to ordain and install leaders today, I would say to my fellow elders and deacons, this is what Christ calls us to in terms of leadership, that we need to set the example in terms of what it means to embrace humility and embody humility. Let me give the last word today then to the Apostle Paul. I can think of no better place in the scriptures that talk about this kind of humility, this humility of Psalm 131, than what Paul writes in Philippians 2. Paul says to all of us then, do nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. He says, let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. And let the same mind or attitude be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped or exploited, but he emptied himself. And taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, he was found in human form. And he humbled himself, and he became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Paul goes on to say, therefore God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And all of God's people said, amen. This is what we're called to. Let's pray. Lord, we ask for this kind of contentment, this kind of humility that Psalm 131 speaks of. Lord, help us to see where pride lurks in our own lives today. We confess to you that we are so quick to want to help our neighbor remove the log or the speck from their eye when we have a log in our own eye. So Lord, reveal the places in us that need, um, that need your grace, that need your healing. Lord, teach us, continue to teach us what it means for us to take up the cross and to follow you. And Lord, that we would be a people who, Lord, join you in getting low and taking up the basin and the towel so that we might be servants to all. Father, thank you that that Jesus is not only the example for us of what this looks like, but he is the very source that enables us to live this kind of humility. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for your love for us. It is in Christ's name we pray, amen.